much, Dan, by the way, and thank you for documenting Bilderberg again this year. Um, next, I've got um, a lady called Belinda McKenzie, who some of you will know. Um, she's uh, been an activist tirelessly for years, helping to uh, expose 9-11 and also um, campaigning for Holly Gregg. She's an absolutely fantastic and hard-working woman. Really, really does deserve your applause. And she's going to speak to you now. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for your, for your claps, but it's not me, it's the cause. The cause is the protection of children, the next generation. Let's hear it for the children. Louder, louder. Tell those people over there. The children, the children come first. They should come first. They should always come first. Their voice should always be heard. And unfortunately, it's not being. And I attribute this to what I always refer to as the private lives of public people. Today, we're here not to celebrate public people, but to challenge them. So I would like to see everybody going away today to start challenging them about their private lives and in particular their attitude to the protection of children. If we make children the key plank of any campaign we're in, put the children in that campaign with you alongside you. Always ask the politicians, ask the public figures, what do they think about paedophile rings not being investigated? What do they think about families being broken into and children being taken away from loving parents by the social services and the police. Babies being snatched, newborn babies snatched from hospital wards just after birth. This is going on in this society. So it's a, a horrible subject in one way but it's what we've all got to, whatever campaign we're in, we've all got to get into this issue of the abuse of the children by our politicians, our judges, and the social services and it starts because we have a culture of uninvestigated paedophilia. Now if that isn't familiar to you by now after the Jimmy Savile revelations then I don't know where you've been for the last uh, 10 months, 11 months. It's all coming out now. I represent something called the Holly Gregg Campaign for Justice. Holly Gregg, it's actually a, a campaign located principally in Scotland because she's a Scottish young woman. She's 33, she has Down syndrome, so she's not only a child victim but she's also a disabled, a vulnerable adult victim. And in 2000, in case anybody here hasn't heard the story, Holly and her mother by that time she was 20, went to the police and reported the fact to them, this is Aberdeen, the Grampian police, that she had been raped throughout her childhood, she said, by her father and brother. Now get that fact first of all because, yeah, wait, wait, this is May 2000, right? The first people to be reported were her father and brother. What should the Grampian police have done? What should the Aberdeen police have done at that point? Well, they did exactly what they should have done straight away, which was to obtain medical forensic confirmation that Holly was a victim of long-term serial historic abuse. I don't need to go into the facts any more than that. They got the confirmation. What should they have done next? They should have gone round to the home of the people she named, who happened to be her father and brother. But they didn't. And this is where the whole fiasco has started. The police did not do their duty in May 2000 of investigating, questioning, going to the home, seizing computers and bedding of the people Holly named as her abusers. Why didn't they do that? And this is the question that everybody will ask then. Why didn't they? It became a little bit apparent why not, because a few months later, we now, when, they, when the police didn't do anything, then obviously Anne and Holly, who wanted this injustice put right and wanted the, the criminals brought to, to task over this, and Anne, Anne is a very feisty, very straight up and down Scottish mum. No nonsense. She can, 
she can take on anybody. She has been taking on the authorities for 13 years. So she's not somebody who would just accept that the police were not doing anything. She's, she started a campaign immediately and she's been pressing on with that for 13 years. She's been gagged, unfortunately, by the court, but I'll come to that in a minute. So why didn't the police investigate? Well, when nothing happened, and during that summer of, of 2000, as the weeks went by, Holly told her mum more and more facts about what had happened to her, and Anne was absolutely astonished. She told her mother that just before her beloved uncle, Anne's brother's death in a car fire, in 1997, this is three years previously, Anne's brother had been found in a burning car late at night off the A90 road outside Aberdeen. The doors of the car were shut, the windows were sealed, a piece of plastic piping lay on the ground beside the car. The emergency services arrived around nine o'clock they stayed till around 1.30. There were two witnesses to the car fire because they said that they'd actually tried to pull Anne's brother Roy out of the car and revive him. And one of them had had his hands a bit burned by this, although there were no burn marks at all on Roy's body. So he tried to revive him and in the process had broken because this is in the autopsy report, which Anne didn't get for 12 years. The police wouldn't give it to her. Through the course of trying to revive Anne's brother, six ribs had been broken, and the sternum, which is the hardest bone in the body, cracked. There was a big bang on the back of his skull. Well, he could have got that through being dragged out of the car. But the, the bones were strangely broken. It, it's not just a normal case of trying to resuscitate somebody. And at the scene, those two witness there were two witnesses. There was somebody called Sylvester Cadger, who was the guy who rev tried to revive Roy Gregg. But there was another person at the scene who Anne tried to get the name of, and who has the identity of whom has never been revealed. Whether he or she was male or female, is not known. The only thing that is known is that he or she was a nurse. Right, so a male or female nurse was at the scene and why haven't the police been in questioning him and why has his identity been covered up? So already Anne was suspicious from the start that there was foul play in the case of her brother's very violent and unusual death and she knew her brother would not commit suicide, he's just not the type. Roy was a very cheerful um, easy going, um, very relaxed fellow. He was a publican for quite a lot of his life and he had no money worries and he had nothing that would give any reason for him to want to top himself. So Anne was suspicious from the start and she was even more suspicious when shortly after Roy's death, her ex-husband by now, she's now separated from him or divorced, went into Roy's house and stole all his bank documents. Right, and, and therefore Roy's house passed to Anne's husband, not to her. She should have inherited Roy's money and his house. So she's had from her ex-husband her bank, uh, her inheritance stolen <coughs> and she now suspects and she's always suspected that her brother was killed. But then Holly, going back to 2000, during the summer of 2000, Holly told her mum something else that her mum had no idea about, which was that when her father was raping her one time, her brother, Anne's brother, Holly's uncle, had arrived and had found, had stumbled on Anne's husband, Holly's dad, raping Holly. Right? And when, I'll call him Dennis, I'm not supposed to be naming names, but I'll call him Dennis. So when Dennis was surprised in the act, he then threatened to kill Roy. I'll kill you. Holly picked that up. Holly has 
Down syndrome, when you speak to Holly, it's always in very short sentences, but they are to the point. What did he say, Holly? I'll kill you. She told her mother that. So, of course, now we are doubly suspicious that this was a murder, a murder of Roy, both for the fact that he had been found raping his niece and for the fact that he'd stolen Orlan's money. What have the police done about this? Nothing. On the night in question, the night of the car fire, <coughs> they wound up their inquiries completely by one o'clock in the morning and the coroner's verdict was that it was suicide. Suspected suicide. Death from smoke inhalation, suspected suicide. That's been the official verdict all these years. Well, sorry, but that suspicious death needs investigating, along with Holly's allegations. And in fact, it ties up with another car fire, which actually achieved prominence in Scotland in 2011. And funnily enough, the man accused of that crime, Malcolm Webster, this is all public so I can name these names, <coughs> he killed his first wife in very similar fashion to the way that Roy Gregg met his death. And Malcolm Webster was convicted. <laughs> and now funnily enough, Malcolm Webster is a nurse. And in that trial, it came out that his wife had received a payment from Malcolm Webster of something like £10,000 for what? That was left hanging. There seems to be a link between the Websters and the Greggs and the death of Roy. And I can say that because the Webster case is very public. Now, we're getting back to Holly and her allegations. The police have not investigated her father and, and her brother, so Holly tells her mum that there were other people involved, and this is where the temperature in this case starts to rise. She named altogether 20 other people, and she's named one or two since, but we stick at the figure 22 altogether, because that's enough to be going on with. They were involved in some way in the abuse that she suffered and she said they were all part of a sort of social circle and many of them were actually related to her father and brother. These people have never been questioned. She went on 26th of August again to the Aberdeen police to report these 20 other people. She got as far as 16 and then a social worker who was at that interview injected her in the leg and she couldn't get to the end of the list. She passed out. Ten days later, she and her mum, Holly actually only told her mum all this information at age 20 because that was the year that the marriage between her mum and dad finally did broke up, break up. Dennis had been particularly violent to Anne and they had taken refuge in a, in a women's refuge in Aberdeen and it was only when they were in the re women's refuge that Holly had the, the courage at last away from her dad to tell her mum everything that had happened because her violent father, nasty piece of work Dennis, he had told Holly what paedophiles usually say to their victims, if you tell anybody I'll kill your mum, your sister, your brother, your pets, whoever, I'll kill you and Holly had been threatened throughout her childhood that one word to anybody else and her beloved mother would be dead and her dogs would be dead. So that's why she'd kept quiet. And also a lot of the abuse had happened away from the family home. So Anne, who was being regularly drugged by her husband, they were always tired in the family. Anne says, we were so tired. Holly and Dennis were tired. I was tired. We were all so sleepy. It was as if we were ill. This is how Anne describes it. Well, there, there's a very good reason for that, because when Holly was taken away at night, she was drugged and her mum was drugged. And so nobody knew anything about it. Holly did go to the, to the doctor. Um, Anne did take Holly to the doctor, because she had strange symptoms in her teens, particularly. 
and the doctor said nothing to worry about Mrs. Gregg. Holly's symptoms are all because of her Down syndrome. It's part of her medical condition. So, as I say, the temperature rises after 26th of August 2000 because 10 days later in the women's refuge, suddenly six or seven police arrive, social workers, a psychiatric nurse, arrive at the refuge. Anne has gone down to put the rubbish outside in the big bins. Holly is upstairs on the second floor in the flat and looking out of the window and she sees her mum being pinned down on the ground, pants pulled down, injected in the buttocks and then prostrate being taken to an ambulance. And this has been the most traumatic thing for Holly of the whole horrible experiences that she has endured throughout her childhood to see her mum being attacked like that and taken away and then no mum for three days, four days because mum's in the mental hospital which is where Anne was taken that triggered terrible post-traumatic stress disorder in Holly and this is why Anne could no, not drop the case I'm going into quite a lot of detail here because quite, quite a few people won't have heard the story, so I'm making sure that everybody knows the story. I'm being told by Silky I've got to wind up. <laughs> so anyway, there's a murder in it. There's 22 people alleged to have been abused, uh, abused a disabled Down syndrome young woman. There's a huge cover-up. There's non-investigation by the police and there's a huge cover-up. I would say millions of pounds of public money, both in Scotland and in Shropshire, which is where Anne and Holly now live, have been spent covering up this paedophile ring, this alleged paedophile ring, rather than investigating Holly's allegations, which is what should happen. We are battering away at the moment at the new Chief Constable at Scotland, of Scotland, who took his office in April this year. Scotland now has a centralised police force. This man, Stephen House, has had letters from me, letters from Robert Green, who is, as you know, Holly's champion. And Robert's story is a whole extra dimension to the case. Please, if you have any time, as soon as you go back, Google Robert Green's blog. Robert Green's blog is very, very interesting. Robert Green, who was champion, championing Holly's cause for three years, was sent to prison last year for breaching the peace in Scotland, for having named some of the people that Holly alleged abused her, as well as her father and brother. For that, he was convicted and served a sentence. Well, he was sentenced for a year and served three months. We had a big public campaign, public campaign in Aberdeen. Robert Green had a post bag overflowing with letters, cards, gifts, well wishes every day of the three months he served. The prison, um, Craig Inch's jail in Aberdeen, couldn't hold him more than three months because he was too popular. So they had to let him go. <laughs> So Robert Green is the hero of this campaign and Robert would like you all to know today that he's written to the new Chief Constable of Scotland three times in the last few months and I've written once to ask what in the, in the view of this new top policeman in Scotland constitutes a good reason for investigating a crime of serious sexual abuse of a child. Could we please hear it from the police constable? Should serious sexual abuse of a child be investigated and how should that happen, please? No answer. That's, that's where we are today. I've got to stop. 